Well, hello. Uh, thank you to everyone for coming out tonight. Uh, I'm Josh Christie, and I'm a partner at Print, a bookstore. Just a few housekeeping details before we start. If you have any questions, please feel free to enter them in the chat box on the bottom right or in the Q&A function, which is on the bottom bar of the Zoom window. If you'd like a copy of This is the Night Our House Will Catch Fire, we will include a purchase link in the chat box. All of the copies purchased from print will come with signed book plates from Nick, and we have a limited number of broadside posters available free with purchase while supplies last. But now, on to our speakers tonight. Tom Barbash is the author of four books. He grew up on the Upper West Side of Manhattan and currently lives in Marin County. Nick Flynn is the author of four memoirs and four volumes of poetry. A professor on the creative writing faculty at the University of Houston, he lives in Brooklyn, New York. Please join me in virtually welcoming Tom Barbash and Nick Flynn. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks for being here. Uh, I see some names, some familiar names. It's, that's nice. Uh, I'm not going to pay attention to those names, though. I think I'll close that so I don't get distracted. Uh, and Tom, it's so good to see you, Tom. Um, Great seeing you, Nick. Yeah, thanks for being here. Thanks for beaming in all the way from Marin County uh, to you know, to wherever we are, to these little boxes. Um, My honor. So, <clears throat> and I'm really, and thanks to Print Bookstore, um, who's sponsoring this event. Uh, it's beautiful space. I, I actually was looking forward to visiting it, but, uh, you know, we can't do that right now. Uh, but as soon as we can, I'm looking forward to going in there. Uh, and uh, I hope all of you uh, you know, if you don't buy my book, buy Tom's book or buy somebody's book from Print Bookstore. Uh, yeah. Uh, so I'm going to read, the, the plan is I'm going to read a little bit of this new book that just came out uh, yesterday. Uh, it officially came out yesterday. It's called This is the Night Our House Will Catch Fire. Um, I'll say a little bit about how, it, how I wrote it or what, uh, how it came into being. Uh, I, my, about five years ago, uh, when my daughter turned seven, she began asking me to tell her stories about what I was like when I was seven. And uh, as I told the stories, they sort of took on the feel of a fairy tale. Uh, uh, I, I didn't have many memories, but I had sort of one very vivid memory, and that was of this man that lived behind the woods of my grandmother's called Mr. Man. Uh, and I'm going to read a chapter of Mr. Man to start out, uh, so I won't tell you so much about it. <coughs> Excuse me. So I'll start with that. So I'm going to read a little bit, uh, and then Tom and I will have a little discussion. And then if you guys have questions, we'll uh, answer some questions. Mr. Mann. Tell me the story of Mr. Mann, my daughter pleads. It's a story I've told her a hundred times already. This, apparently, is what it is to be seven. You can bear to hear the same story over and over, again and again. Or maybe she has noticed that each time I tell it, I add a little more. She wants to know what it was like for me when I was seven. The story of Mr. Mann is what I remember. This is how I begin. Mr. Mann lived in the woods behind my grandma's, in a house near the cemetery. My grandma warned me to keep away from his house, to not even get close. That if I do, he'll come outside with his shotgun and blast me full of rock salt. My grandma told me she knew a kid my age who thought he was clever got too close and bammo. The doctor had to pick each crystal shard out of his back with tweezers. You're awake the whole time, she said. No painkillers. It didn't kill him, I asked. It's like being stung by a swarm of hornets, she answered. I tell my daughter that when I learn rock salt won't kill me, I'll end up spending that summer, the summer I'm seven, the summer after our house caught fire, trying to get as close as I can to Mr. Mann. Or maybe I begin like this. The first time I noticed him is in the supermarket where my mother makes donuts. I'd been sent out alone on a mission to the potato chip aisle. He was standing in front of the ones I wanted, wise, murmuring something I couldn't hear. Long, dirty coat, beat up hat, pulled down to his eyebrows, beard gone wild. I'd never seen him nor anyone like him before not in my hometown. I watch as he bends down to the big bags on the lower shelves, as he lifts one to his face, holds it with both hands near to his eyeballs, as if he wants to study it more closely. He whispers something into it, something like a spell. Then he puts it to his ear like he can answer, 
Then he slips the whole bag like a big balloon under his long, dirty coat. At this moment, he seems for the first time to notice me, standing a couple steps behind him. He nods. I nod back. Then he turns, walks down the aisle, right past the checkout girls and the baggers, and out through the automatic doors and into the sunlight. In the car on the way home, we pass him, standing on the shoulder by the graveyard, his face turned from us, his hands still under his coat. You see that guy, I ask? Don't stare, my mother answers. Who is he? Don't stare. I don't tell her that I know what's hidden under his coat. I don't know why I don't tell her. From then on, I see him everywhere. And I'll skip a little. <clears throat> So this is this um this chapter is called the happy jar, um, and uh, I'll read a little bit from the last chapter because it'll explain what a happy jar is, uh, and it there's someone named Vernon in it, and Vernon is uh, my mother's boyfriend, uh, who she was with, who was over our house the night our house caught fire. In, in earlier versions of the story, it was a perfect summer day. Mom and I made an apple pie. Vernon grilled sausages on the back deck. Then. After we'd all gone off to bed, after mom, I guess, tucked me in, the raccoons came and ripped and tipped the hibachi over. The coals fanned out across the wooden planks. It was then only a matter of time. But it was always a story, like all stories that came in several jars, like those jars the Egyptians would use to hold the entrails of their dead, canopic, lungs in one, heart in another, liver in one, spleen in another. You've seen these jars, empty now, the, the organs long desiccated in the Egyptian wing of the Brooklyn Museum. This is the happy jar. What was it we used to chant into the mirror each morning in what used to be called the new age? Every day, in every way, I'm getting better and better. What is it we chant now? Eduardo Corral offers this. Some days, when I catch my reflection in a mirror, I think, Someone has hurt this animal. Years later, when asked about my childhood, I'll say, it was happy. For years after the fire, this is the only jar I'll open, the happy jar. If I tell someone about my mother and how she died, the next question is often, how did you survive? Meaning, how the hell are you so well-adjusted? Well-adjusted, I'll think to myself. But I'll answer, as I always answer, I felt love. I knew my mother loved me. <clears throat> I'll answer this way even after shifting phantasmagoria. I learned that she'd set the fire herself. I'm 35 when I track Vernon down. 35 is, perhaps, the age when one can approach the past without believing it will annihilate you. To annihilate means to reduce to nothing, to ash. Vernon laughs when I mention the raccoons. That house was a real shithole, he says. All it needed was a match. He tells me she had something going on with the local insurance agent, that she got the house insured for more than it was worth. As he spoke, I both knew and didn't know what that meant. In that moment, one jar became two. In one was the fire, and the other was my mother setting the fire. In one, I was happy. In one, I'd survived. In the other, I never made it out of that house. One meant she was clever, resourceful, that she knew how to get over. One meant she was broke, desperate, and a fire meant we would get a nicer house, and we did. The other meant something else, something I wasn't ready to take in, not fully. It's entirely possible I'm still not ready, but here I am, whole, holy, full of holes. This is called Six Baby Mice. Six baby mice. No one's paying much attention. So when school ends, I'm free to wander. It's the summer after the fire. If my mother was out working the night before or on a date, I'll wake up at my grandma's. At some point each morning, I'll announce to my grandma that I'm heading into the woods. The woods are vast. I might as well have said I was diving into a bottomless pit, but it seemed enough for her to know this. Don't get in any trouble, she'll say, or be careful, or watch yourself or something equally grandmotherly. Dinner's at six, she'll say. One morning along the path, I'll find an old bottle dump, 
I line the bottles up on a rotting board and pitch rocks at them. Underneath the board, I find six tiny baby mice squirming in little tunnels carved out in the dirt. The mother is nowhere to be seen. I watch them for a while, then lay the board back down. Every day that summer, I drag myself a little closer to Mr. Mann's. From a safe distance, I begin to study him. No screens, his windows shut tight. Frogs in his pond, no wind. Sometimes I see him poking around in his fallen down barn or feeding his broke back horse, but mostly he's a ghost. Years later, I'll publish a book of poems, Some Ether, my first book. The first poem in it is called Bag of Mice. It is one of the few poems of mine to come from a dream. I simply transcribe it. And then I read the poem. I dreamt your suicide note was scrawled in pencil on a brown paper bag, and in the bag were six baby mice. The bag opened into darkness, smoldering from the top down. The mice huddled at the bottom, scurried the bag across a shorn field. I stood over it, and as the burning reached each carbon letter of what you'd written, your voice released into the night like a song, and the mice grew wilder. I wrote this poem before I found Vernon in Florida, before he told me my mother had set our house on fire. It may seem strange, but I swear I never consciously, consciously linked my mother's suicide with the fire, and I'm reluctant to do so now. It would feel reductionist to make it easier if that were even remotely possible to explain her suicide. Did it weigh on her, what she had done when she was younger, when she was desperate for a way out? Fire appears in each of my books, but then so does a donut. That's the way the my subconscious works. I'll read a couple more passages. <clears throat> this is called asbestos. The word asbestos derives from the ancient Greek meaning unquenchable or inextinguishable, which seems the opposite of how we think of it. Our house on Brook Street survived the fire, in part because the asbestos shingles repelled the flames. Here's the house, here are the flames, kept apart almost by asbestos. Asbestos makes a house seem constant, as if nothing will take it down, not termites, not fire. Can I say my mother knew it would never burn? Can I say she intentionally bought a house sheathed in asbestos across from a fire station because she knew it, us, would have a chance or two of being saved? One theory of the universe is that it is expanding faster than we ever believed, that it isn't constant. If we shine a light into the universe, it will go on forever. It will never find an end, because the universe isn't a bottle where light can find the wall and bounce off it. Its structure is what it does. It expands, so the light keeps moving farther and farther out into this endless expanse. Maybe this explains why I can never come to the end of this story, why it always seems there's more to ask. The universe is expanding. The house is on fire. No matter how long I look at it, I don't know where fire goes if it does not go back inside the match. I don't know where the child goes if he does not go back inside the mother. The house I grew up in is now filled with strangers. The furniture now holds no emptiness, shaped like my mother. The youngest fireman is still on the lawn, his hose still in his hand, left to look for sparks that might still be alive. Once the flames are dead, once the sparks are silent, he'll declare the house empty, but he won't check that closely. He won't see I'm still huddled inside. He won't see my mother still standing by the stove, waiting for the pie to cool. We'll all pass right through him. <clears throat> and I'll finish with this, this one piece, and then Tom and I will have a discussion. It's called Dark Energy. They say you can only know what you are capable of knowing. They say that if you get caught in a black hole, the laws of physics don't hold. They say that the universe is made up of 70% dark energy, 30% dark matter, that less than 1% is what we think of as us, what we can see, what we can measure, what we can understand. So much, almost everything, is unknown. Yet without dark matter, there would be no mass. But without mass, There'd be no atoms, no stars, no planets, and certainly not a hundred children making a whirlpool out of a summer day. Some nights, 
After my mother got home from waitressing, as she was undressing for bed, she'd point to me, then point to her stretch marks, those tiny purple snakes crawling up her belly from somewhere far below. You did this to me, she'd say. I knew what she was saying. I knew it was true. Annihilation. I had ruined her body by being inside her body. This body, her body, I have carried it so far. James Joyce offers this. The radiance is the whatness of a thing. This supreme quality is felt by the artist when the aesthetic image is first conceived in his imagination. The mind in that mis mysterious instant Shelley likened beautifully to a fading coal. A fading coal. Let's call every word my mother uttered dark matter. Light bends around it in spooky ways. Some days, it seems, I could hold it in my hands, everything she said. Some days, this is all I know of radiance. I'll stop there. <clears throat> and now Tom will come back. Hey, <laughs> that was wonderful. I'm so glad you, I mean, having, having read them and hearing you read them aloud, it, it's, it's, it's wonderful. I, I, I really appreciate it. Um, oh, thanks, Tom. So um, one of the things I, I was talking to you earlier and mentioning that I actually went to a Quaker grammar school and a Quaker college, and your, uh, this book reminds me a little bit of the experience of Quaker meeting. And one of the things that happens is Quaker meeting is that if you're inspired to say something, you, and often it's just beginning with an image or a thought, and then there's a pause in between. And how much, one of the things that, many things that I love about this book are the pauses and the chance to, to sit there, to, to hear what it is that that particular piece is created within you and sit with it a little bit before you start again. And I'm wondering how much of the design you know, how important that, that aspect of those pauses are to you. Yeah. Um, what, what do they call that in quick? Is that called testifying? Or what do you call that when you stand up and say something? Isn't there I'm some not, word for that? When yeah, I don't know. But I mean, I, you know, because it was when I was like six, you know, Mrs. Fisk would talk about coring an apple, you know, and what that meant. And we'd sort of sit there, you know, and then someone else would stand yeah. up. Yeah. But I, it, and um, it, it seems to me that there's something I really appreciate about it rather than having one person just speak at you for a long period of time. Yeah. And it, it's so interactive. I guess it, what it asks for the reader is to really is to, is to sit with it and be a different person and then move into the next thing. So, um, yeah, I think, I think it's a beautiful uh, tradition. I've done a little bit of that. Like uh, the, I, I've been to some Unitarian uh, churches and they do that at Unitar Unitarian also. Um, yeah. The, the structure of this is, is, um, those pauses in between, I think they probably come from my, you know, I'm primarily a poet. And so the white space is really important, like the, the, and what gets, what gets filled in there, like how you stop and leave something out. And that's where like the, the reader sort of, you know, you know, ideally sort of rushes in with their own uh, interpretation or feeling or connection. Um, I do have like, you know, through the book there are, and, and I tried to read things that sort of had some connection. So like a donut appears like more than once in this, that little section I read, uh, you know, my mother's making donuts, then the, the universe is like shaped like a donut. And there's, um, you know, there's these sort of image clusters that sort of keep sort of appearing through the book. So when you see them, oh, like they, absolutely. And fire, yeah. you know, and smoke and, and the black yeah. hole, which is connects to the, the whirlpool when you're, you know, a kid in swimming, you know, in the yeah. I mean, the things keep changing meaning between the pieces. Yeah. 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 And, and yeah, what's in between is like, you know, ideally like, you know, with an ideal reader would, uh, yeah, I mean, just be able to keep track of that in some way in their subconscious. And when it, when it appears again, when that image appears again, they would, it, would, it would ring a bell and they would have a little like uh, moment, but it would suddenly it would, it would lead them in another direction or, or to see it a different way, to see that, you know, what, what seems very benign at one point, you know, a donut is benign and then it becomes sort of, you know, uh, insidious and then becomes like sort of, you know, connected to the entire universe. So it keeps sort of changing. So it isn't one thing. Uh, and, I, and it is, I think it is the white space. I think it is the, the pauses. I, I, you know, usually like in any writing, I, I don't know about you, but like usually any, any piece of writing I do, and usually any student's work I read, it instantly gets better if I cut the first paragraph and the last paragraph. Uh, instantly the piece just sort of elevates and, you know, you're, then you're in the world of mystery and the unknown rather than being led into something and then, you know, led by the hand out of it. You know, you just sort of like yeah, I, you're in I, it the I, whole time. So. I completely agree. Um, yeah. And I wondered, you know, I mean, I, I guess 
because what's on everybody's mind out here is fire right now, you know, and, and actually yeah. like right outside, even today, the air quality is terrible and it, and it's, um, you know, we've been sort of locked inside with, with the, the smoky air. Um, but then reading yeah. about, about, about the, it's such a strong presence in the book. And one of the things I was, uh, I was thinking about is that I remember my mother died when I was in college. Um, she uh, died of lung cancer. And then every time I'd start a movie, I would be unprepared for the fact that the mother died of cancer. You know, they it would hit me everywhere. And I'm just thinking about yeah. fire. And there's a section you have about synecdoche. Am I pronouncing it? Which I've seen the movie, the Philip scene one. Yeah. And of course, there's fire in that. And that, but that notion of of and a lot of what your book does is there's certain things that that um, that that are your story, but you find it everywhere. Whether you're watching Buster Keaton or whether you're watching synecdoche, what you know, whatever, wherever you go. Their, their resonances of that story. And it's a very associative book. So it's moving to different places. And even if it is seemingly going far away from that initial story, you're finding that story everywhere, right? So that, yeah. that, that sense of fire. And then the last thing that I would just say about fire is, and, and even there's that image that you have of saving your friend with a hockey stick, you know, who's, who's who, you know, from, you, you're, you save his life. And that fire taught you that. And then you have this line that says, with all the things that fire, destructive things, that fire, you said, I think there's a line, fire taught you everything, right? So yeah, I guess yeah. beginning with that, that image and, and its, its power throughout the book. Yeah, it's a, you know, it is like the central element to the book. And, you know, but there also has to be an antidote. To, so there's a lot of this, this you know, my, my uh, refuge from the fire is going to the ocean and going into the, the, the salt marsh where they're, you know, you can't, it won't burn. Um, so there's that too, that's sort of to, to create that tension between the two. Um, and, and as for like seeing things everywhere, I'm, I'm teaching a workshop right now for the Fine Arts Work Center with a, a really cool group of students. Um, and uh, online, of course, unfortunately, we're, or fortunately, it's, you know, it's nice that we're, we're a, some people are, you know, wired in from California and stuff. Um, and I, I read this quote from, um, uh, from Adrian Rich to them uh, yesterday. And it's, it's about that, it's about, uh, it's from her, an essay called Hermit Scream. Maybe I'll try to pull it up here and just uh, see it because it sort of answers your question um, or, or, or talks, it speaks to your question. Uh, Adrian Rich said this beautiful thing. Um, Once you live any piece of your vision, it opens you to a constant onslaught of necessities, of horrors, but of wonders too, of possibilities. Like meteor showers all the time, bombardment, constant connections. Um, and that idea of like, you know, once you live any piece of your vision, like I think that's when we're in a project, you're, you're living some piece of your vision. And, it, and when you're in that, suddenly the whole world, you start to see the pattern and how everything is connected. You see that. I think everything is connected in some way. But, you know, that's, what the, that's the, both the burden, the, the horror, and the, the beauty of like being in a project is like suddenly you, you get to see how everything is connected and it's, it's terrifying and overwhelming. And that's why I don't think I would do it all the time. And even writing this book, I had to like take a long breaks uh, in between. I'd write it for, because it's pretty intense. It was intense for me psychologically to re return to that time of the fire and uh, uh, to see it in a different way. Um, and uh, uh, so I'd have to I'd write it in these sort of bursts, like these sort of month long bursts where I just would, would be in it. And then I would just put it aside and I wouldn't think about it. I, you know, on a conscious level, I'd put it aside for like three months and then just go back into it. And then so it wasn't like a continuous thing. And, but even in those three months, like, I would still see things. It, it, things would come out like, you know, Notre Dame burns. And, uh, you know, you can't help but, you know, suddenly that sort of makes its way in and, and uh, into, into, the, into the book also. Yeah, but in, in other images, I mean, you brought up donuts. And I think it, uh, for me, it's funny. I, I lived in upstate New York in a different, you know, in a, in a sort of dying industrial part of upstate New York on Lake Ontario, Oswego, New York. And I remember at the time um, thinking that I had this theory that all towns were either donut towns or bagel towns, you know, and Oswego <laughs> is definitely a donut town, you know, yeah, but just yeah. that, and then, and what donuts, donuts are what, where cops go to <laughs> the donut shops, but just, you know, that has different resonances. I just feel like the way that you've written is whatever you put becomes fresh if looked at from a different perspective. And the book is constantly jumping out and it's and the form is different from from you know there, there's all these different shapes and different perspectives. You even go at the fire. You know, I was saying before, um, you write your own police report. You know, you know that that, that so that's it, there's a it, it, so even if it is about the same subject, 
it keeps changing, you know, as, as you're evolving. So, um, yeah. but what I wanted to ask is about telling your daughter stories, you know, that idea. And, and, you know, there's a little bit, you know, there's one story in which you're sort of, you're explaining the story has, has a parallel with um, Occupy Wall Street. And in fact, you clearly named the monkey after me, right? The monkey is Barabbas, right? You know, and that's <laughs> kind of close. Like that. But, um, but I, it's, a, it's an homage, like, yes, it's an homage. I, I, I appreciated it, you know, and eventually he doesn't get all the coconuts. So, um, <laughs> but if, if you could talk a little bit about, you know, as a writer, you know, and as, as you know, um, just the shape of these stories, did they surprise you? How much intention do you have when you tell Maeve a story, you know, and how much discovery is there in that process? And how did they find these stories find themselves into, into a book? Yeah, um, I mean, since it, the book did start out with this, you know, my daughter asking me about my childhood when I was seven. And, and it turned out that I, I told her the story of Mr. Mann uh, and the story would get, you know, uh, longer and longer as I remembered more because uh, was, that was really the most vivid memory I, I had of when I was seven. And she'd ask me who, you know, what, you know, what school I went through. She asked like what my, my teacher was when I was in fourth, I think that's like fourth grade maybe or maybe younger. No, it's like second grade or something. Um, and uh, she would ask me like who my teacher was and who my classmates were. I couldn't remember anything. Like, none of that, you know, it was just a total school was just a complete wash. I couldn't remember anything in school, but I could remember outside of school and going to this, you know, this fairy tale like place where this guy, this hermit like guy would, who seemed was told to be sinister, but in the end, I think he was actually very kind. Uh, that sort of comes out in the end of the book also. Um, and, uh, and so that, you know, that I, it's just stayed with me. And what stays in your subconscious, I think, really is what you, um, uh, where, the, where the books are, you know, where, where the art is, is that, that the images that keep rising up and the people that keep rising up and the, the language that keeps rising up. The, the idea of the donut is like, you know, there's a donut in every one of my books. Um, you know, it's just like this thing. And I, it, I'm, you know, relatively sure that it comes from, you know, being like five years old and watching my mother make donuts, like in this, at five in the morning at this, um, you know, it was, it was just felt wonderful. And I, I went back to that supermarket is still there. You know, it's, it's changed ownership and it's different name and stuff. And it's a little fancier now, but the, the mixer my mother used is still there. It's like this enormous mixer and it's like still, it's a it's sort of a, this remarkable object. that's like still sitting in this like bakery at, uh, at this supermarket. Um, so, which I, you know, the mixer makes it into the book too, like her working on this mixer. And I think it, it made it into the book because I went with my daughter and saw it. So the, the structure of the work, you asked about the stories, the structure came from um, when I told her about Mr. Manners, a few months, a few months later after I began telling her, I had a, a gig in Boston and uh, my wife was out of town and I, we didn't have childcare. So I just, I brought my daughter with me in the car. To, I think the Mass Poetry Festival. And uh, on the way, I said, well, let's go see Mr. Mann's house. It's now a museum. So, you know, let's go see it. Let's go go to my hometown so she could see where I was from. And, and uh, we got to go into the museum and walk through it. And then it just happened every, I don't know if it's a coincidence or if it's just like just the way things happen. Like for the next three, three years in a row, the same thing happened. I'd, I'd get home from teaching in May. My wife would be out of town and we had no childcare and I had a gig in Boston. So we'd go and we just would do things. So we ended up going the next year focused on going to the salt marsh where I uh, spent a lot of time. And then the last trip was going into the house that had caught fire, um, like entering into that house, you know, for the first time with my daughter. Uh, and so, and the stories were coming just because, you know, at that age, you know, it's that wonderful thing where you get to read, you get to return to books or things that maybe were read to you or you had heard about as a child, but you haven't read them in a long time to fairy tales and to, um, and, uh, and then to start to make up your own. Like when she was going to bed for a year or so, I would just, rather than read her a book, I would just make up this story and, and, and tell it to her. And then I ended up, since I was going away to teach, I ended up recording it or recording the story and she could listen to it. Like, so she could listen to the story and she could just play it. Uh, and they'd be like about, you know, half an hour long, each one, like a, another installment of this long story that involved, you know, the monkeys and things like that. And I ended up transcribing all the things I had recorded and I it distilled it down. It was like pages and pages. I distilled it down to like maybe a page and a half. Like it's not, it, it, it didn't quite, it would need another, it, it existed more as a story you told into a recorder rather than actually a written story. So I distilled it way down to just the essence of it. 
for this? Well, I was jealous. I mean, I have a 12 year old and, and I try to tell them stories, but they're not as elaborate um, and as interesting as yours. Um, <laughs> I, I wanted to ask you about, you take a lot of risks with the book and, and just personal risks of just the difficulty of writing certain subject matters. And you have this line where it's about the, a sweater. First of all, there's a few things about sweaters. I love you putting on your grandfather's sweater every time you see him and it smells like mothballs. Like smells, I also think is a big part. But there's a line later on where you talk about with, a, with a, you know, it's about telling stories, pull on a loose thread and the whole sweater comes apart. And I'm wondering if, if there's that fear, you have really sensitive subject things about your marriage, you know, about your mother, you know, about all sorts of things, whether there's anything that any, how do you overcome the, the fear that people might have of, of entering in and writing about really complex, difficult family subjects? Yeah, it's, you know, I, I always just tell students also that the, the way I do it is I just, I imagine, you know, I, I just can convince myself that no one's ever going to read it. So, um, so then it allows me to write anything. And then, you know, that's for the drafts. And then even as it gets to the book, like, you know, Basically, what I believe, and I'm fairly sure this is true, that any, anyone who reads a book, even a, especially a memoir, they're not actually reading it to find out about you. They're reading to find out about themselves. I mean, that's why we go to art. And they're trying to see themselves like reflected in it in some way and so, to get some understanding of themselves. They, you know, the, you know I, I find comfort in that, that it's not like, I don't feel like, you know, why don't you care about me? It's like, you know, this is not, you know, you try to make it more of a selfless act uh, that it's for it's for other people. It's, it's the book, you know, any, any book is, is sort of just a dead object until somebody reads it, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't exist until someone activates it and then has an experience with it. So, you know, and yeah, I wrote about hard things, you know, I wrote about, you know, an affair. I wrote about, you know, struggling in my marriage, uh, uh, you know, my mother and her struggles. Um, and yeah, it was, it was tough. It was a tough book to write. Like it was, you know, it's not easy. I don't think that's the thing too. Like, I don't really believe that, you know, I don't, I don't feel that on a, on a basic level that art, that creating art is cathartic um, necessarily. Uh, I think it could be quite damaging because uh, you're going into very dark, you, you, you know, depending on what you're writing about, uh, you go into very sort of psychically difficult places that um, unless you're like taking care of yourself uh, in other ways, it could be really, it could cause some damage. Uh, you know, and I, you know, I, I was definitely on the edge many times writing this, but, you know, I got into, you know, sort of set up a whole network of things to sort of take care of me, uh, you know, yoga and meditation and therapy and then more therapy and, you know, 12 step programs. And just like, it was sort of like a, an endless thing just to get ready to write that for that hour a day. Uh, I took a lot of preparation to do that. I wonder if the form was helpful too, in that because when you get to certain really difficult subjects, you can jump out of it, you know, and then, and then return to it, but rather than getting in there and then lingering in it for 40 pages, you know what I mean? The, the, that idea of, of, mm -hmm. of sort of dropping down. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I, it probably is true. I think, yeah, this sort of, they're contained. Yeah, it's, it's interesting, like, you know, containing the story and these sort of uh, things that, that leave a lot around the edges, like that, that blank space around the edges for other people to come into. I mean, you know, each piece could be, you know, much longer. Uh, but there is a choice like that. This is all I can do right now. <laughs> Maybe, you know, this is all I'm able to do. This is all I'm able to give you at the moment. So, But then you have, you have trace elements of each part that even when you think, like, I mean, I wondered if you could just, because it's someone I hadn't thought of since childhood. I saw Buster Keaton when I was a kid, I remember. I mean, and yeah. people really talk more about Charlie Chaplin, it seems like. But there's yeah. something, because the book is so much about home, too, and concepts and losing home and what is home, you know, and can, does your life start when you leave home? And Buster Keaton's home, you describe this movie, and it's kind of crooked, you know, the sense. And, and But if you could just talk to me a little bit about how he came alive for you and how he was someone you, you wanted to include in the book. Or even sure. if you want to just read a small section of it. Yeah, I could read a little. Of, yeah. I'll read a little of the Keaton section, and then um, yeah. uh, it'll take me a it'll take me a second to find it. Um, let me see here. What have I done? I feel like I there we go. Uh, let me just uh, look through here for a second and find it. Um, oh, I got so, it. What page you got it on? Ninety three. Great. I was almost there. I was almost there. Um, there it is. Um, yeah, so Buster Keaton for me, um, 
and I said, so I said in the beginning here, but I, one of the things I do with my students, I bring in um, an image that is connected to what their project, whatever that means, and then an image that isn't connected to their project. And this was, when I was writing this book, I'd had this image of Buster Keaton walking in front of this house, which I'll describe in a second. And um, um, on my wall, and I just, I do, I, I try to do what I ask my students to do. So I, I brought in, that was my image that wasn't connected to it. And I wrote about it and in writing about it, sort of realized it was connected because it is about, the book is so much about home, like you said. So, and Buster Keaton is also like one of my, and I mean, I love Charlie Chaplin, uh, but somehow I'm more drawn to Buster Keaton to that. Um, Me I mean, too. I, in, in some way that, you know, like I just, I just think the navigator is like just this brilliant thing of, I mean, as a metaphor, just like floating on a huge ship alone in the ocean, you know, and trying to open cans with axes and things. It just felt like sort of, you know, this perfect, with a woman who doesn't know, like he's, he's on there also with a woman that they keep missing each other and not seeing each other for most of the trip. Um, and so this is a short, a Buster Keaton short, Buster Keaton. A film still is tacked to the wall above my desk. In it, Buster Keaton walks in front of his soon to collapse house, a hammer in one hand, a saw in the other. He looks over his shoulder toward us, away from the house. The look on his face as if to say, I'm not really a carpenter, which is obvious. As if to say, I'm pretending, which is what we do. As if to say, I've never lived in a house, which is possible, growing up as he did on the vaudeville circuit. As a boy, Keaton was the punching bag of his family's act. On stage, he was knocked over, kicked, whacked, pummeled. At one point, he had a suitcase handle attached to his side so he could be thrown farther. He found that if he made no response, the audience would laugh louder, so he made no response. In this photo, his house is impossibly crooked. The porch already fallen, the roof will not keep out the rain. The windows, more parallelogram than rectangle, will never open. But even if imperfect, it is still his house. He has built it, likely for a woman, a woman who, I imagine, doesn't even notice him, until the end, of course, when she will see how hard he's been trying, and with so little all along. Um, yeah, and that's written like this, that also has a, one of my philosophies too, like I had this card and I didn't want to research it where the film was from until I just wrote my impressions of it. And then later on, I, I revise it and say like, oh, I, I actually watched the film and he actually, the, they were married, they were in love, the, he and the woman, you know. This, I love that. Yeah. And, and in the book, right, you, you first just describe Buster Keaton and later you go, now I know what the film is, but you allow us to live in the moment before it's sort of ex explained. Yeah. And, uh, I think because I think memoir too. I think that the main thing with memoir is is you know we want we we go to them to find out about the person who's writing it in some ways. You know we'd go to nonfiction to find out about the world, but you know memoir does have like that. It's in between those things. You want to know about the world in a memoir, the world that they live in, but also how they perceive the world. You know, whereas like a nonfiction book, it's less about that, about how the author is perceiving the world, and more we just want to know the world. Uh, so, so you sort of, you sort of need that tension between the two. I think. I mean, that's my philosophy. There's something I, else that, that that I'm seeing in here. It's like there's a the, the the examination of language and the playfulness of it. Like just in the section you read before, whole, holy, full of holes. You know the different meanings. And I'm also thinking, you know, there's a great section where you talk about the word bewilder, and be yeah. wilder and wilding. You know that like so if you. I mean, when it, it's almost as if, you, you know, there are certain words, there's certain images you return to, and there are words that we, we put along with those images. And as the image change for it, the language does too. So, and that's something that's, it's both playful and, and um, it deepens the meaning of the whole book, I think. So. And I think that comes from, you know, poetry also, like the, the idea of like, you know, one of the things for me with poetry is, you know, that I've, you know, gotten from different types of poetry, uh, you know, maybe more postmodernism or, or is, you know, one, one branch and, and that the idea of language is material to think about it, not as like, uh, you know, a thing in itself, but it's material. It's like paint that you're moving around. So you really want to play with the language itself and, 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 and see what it can do and bend it and, you know, look into it, open it up and uh, see what it's made of. And, uh, you know, so there's moments, yeah, there's moments in there where I'm trying to do that. Like, uh, you know, especially with a word that sort of keeps coming back, like bewilderment is a word that I've wrestled with for a long time. Uh, I was just listening to Patti Smith's um, Dancing Barefoot, and she has that, uh, I thought it was so beautiful. She reads a poem at the very end, you probably remember, she reads this poem at the end, but it, un underneath it, she's just sort of chanting, oh God, I'm so confused, like over and over again. Oh God, I'm so confused, like over and over again. And then she's like, but then she reads a poem over the top of it. It's really, it's so beautiful. It's, uh, 
So we were talking before, I was thinking, thinking of lines from songs. Can you talk about, we talked about the moment where the, um, you're going around and you're interviewing people with a tape recorder and the Beatles line your mother says, you know, um, and it might be something you want to read or talk about or. Yeah, um, well, there was just, uh, you know, just sort of to put that in, um, you know, having, you know, after the fire, there was like that Christmas after the fire, there was like more presents under the tree and, you know, why that happened because we didn't really have much money and I got a tape recorder which was like seemed really extravagant at that moment and I went around and recorded you know my brother and my mother saying things I'd go around like a reporter asking him to say stuff and then to sing we, we always got a Beatles album too and so the Beatles was playing and I asked her to sing a little Beatles and uh, I have her singing a line from I'm a loser uh, I'm not what I appear to be uh, and just to sort of you know and I, tr I tried other you know I don't really remember I don't have the tape recorder I don't really remember what she's saying but I remember that day very well and, uh, you know, uh, so I'm not sure if that's what she's saying, but it just seemed like I tried other lines, other Beatles lines in it, and that just seemed the most... Uh, of course she was saying that. <laughs> yeah, appropriate, yeah, yeah. Um, speaking of which, did you really interview all your, your mother's old boyfriends? I did all, yeah, all, like pretty much all of them. I don't, I think one, there was a cop that wouldn't interview me, that they wouldn't let me interview him. Um, uh, he was, he was, yeah, he was... <laughs> He was a little stereotypically copish, um, and uh, but the rest, uh, yeah, the rest I, I interviewed about a dozen of them. Yeah. And how do you? Is that part of your process to interview people sometimes when you're trying to mine the past, or is that just for that instance? At some at some point, um, I would ask like with this this book, you know, the only person I mean, I I have, you know, my mother's uh, boyfriend. She was with the time Vernon, who I read about. His name isn't really Vernon. Um, that's a changed name, but. Uh, I did interview him about, and he's told me about the fire. But the only one who would really would be aware of this fire at the time would be my brother, who was also part of the fire. So he has, you know, his memories are also pretty vague about it also. Like, but he just, you know, he remembers certain things I do, but not, you know, not exactly. So, yeah. You know, it's a really powerful moment in the book is the conversation when you, uh, you see a therapist and he confronts you about alcohol, about you being an alcoholic. He says it, you know, which you're not prepared for in the moment, right? But he basically says, you know, if, if we can't agree on this truth, we can't go on. But that, that was... I know. I almost read that. That was, a, that was the end of a piece that I read, um, that I'd read, but uh, I had I, left it off. Yeah. It was, it was a funny thing. He just, you know, I, I knew I was an alcoholic since I was a kid, since I was young, because I came from a town of alcoholics. Um, and uh, so when he said I was an alcoholic, I said, well, I know that. And he said, well, that means you can't drink. I said, no, no, that means you do drink. That's what an alcoholic does. And yeah. uh, then he said, well, you know, he sort of threw his arms up, but I ended up not drinking after that. I think we're going to do some questions now. I, yeah. I, I look like, looks like. We're yeah, here. yeah. I hate to yeah. stick my head into this great conversation. No, to, no. To intrude you. with a few questions, but um, got a couple of questions from the audience. The first is for Nick from Erica. And the question is, uh, for Nick, I'm just wondering if you thought about To Kill a Mockingbird with the Mr. Man stories, and if Scout Jim and Boo Radley are in there somehow. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, that's, a, again, the thing with, like, having, you know, a kid and, and reading books. So, you know, To Kill a Mockingbird is one of my daughter's favorite books and favorite movies. And, uh, you know, we've, so we've seen it uh, a bunch of times. And, yeah, I, I, I didn't realize... I didn't make the connection until I sort of reread it, until I went back and reread it. But just the idea of, and the thing about Boo Radley too, is that he turned out to be this good guy at the end. You know, he turns out to be like the savior at the end, the which is, yeah, the hero. Um, and so, and that took me a while to figure out, to, to get to that, 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 you know, what Mr. Mann was, what his, why I kept returning to it. Uh, that, that was a lot of therapy to figure that out and to find his goodness or something. So, yeah. Thanks, Erica. I think I know Erica. Hi, Erica. And then uh, from Elaine, for, for both of you, since you both write nonfiction, um, the question is, my memoir students often wonder about the role of accuracy versus poetics in memoir, which is simultaneously the most banal and most important question they could ask. How does accuracy work for you or not? You want to start, Tom? Why don't you start with that? No, you, you start, Nick. Okay, yeah. okay. Um, well, I think, I think, you know, like I like I was saying before, like what I am interested in, in, in memoir, especially is to get the world, the physics of the natural world, like really accurately to really sort of not like make things up, like, especially like cause and effect, like something, one thing happened and caused another thing to happen, or just even like what the, you know, what the landscape is like outside. So I think all those things affect 
why people do things. I think they're all like really important. But then my perception of those things is the, the more lyric poetic part of it. So, and that creates a tension between the two. So I think there's room for both. I, I think one or the other would, um, um, would make a less of a book. So I think I, I encourage both of them, but to also to be really sort of rigorous with the, uh, um, the accuracy though. Yeah, I, I would agree. I mean, I, I think to a certain extent you have a memory and then you can feed it through research or through something that you might not have perceived at the time. But you, if, you, if you aren't true to how it actually felt or how it was, you know, the whole thing can fall apart. I mean, once you start down a false path, yeah, it, it's, it's, nothing is going to work and nothing's going to resonate. So, yeah. All right. And just like uh, the old fashioned in-person events, now that someone has asked a question, the questions are rolling in. <laughs> so uh, the next question from, with my apologies, uh, Adela, I believe is the pronunciation, um, is I've always admired the vignettes in your memoirs, short sprints. How long does it take to write each story? Can you write each day until you finish one story? Can you talk a little bit about your writing practice? Sure. Um, well, I'm doing... This this book was written in a, a very particular way, like a different than other books. I mean, like every book has a different has its own sort of uh, process. And this one, I'm like I say, I'm teaching this workshop this week, and I'm it's sort of I'm doing it. I, I wrote a lot of this book while I was teaching, like in, in in writing workshops. Like I would I would sort of set up this thing, and and I would do the exercises with the students, and then we sort of figure out how to get it. So in a week, we sort of generate a lot of material. And it's all sort of around like a, it starts to all sort of be speaking to each other. It's many pages of writing, but it all is sort of speaking and coming out of our other writing. It's just maybe some scene that we're just developing and deepening. And then um, you take it and try to sort of fit it all together into one thing, uh, into one sort of, you know, chapter or essay or, and uh, it, usually it's a mess. It's really gangly. And then it takes, and then it takes a couple m months to work on that, to get it into shape, to fit in something. But at the end of those two months, it might break apart and become two chapters or five chapters. It might, you know, it might be chapters that speak to each other that are sort of like going across um, a, 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 the book. Maybe they're, they maybe they're not right next to each other, but they're spread out over the book. Uh, so that's, that's really like how I did it. I hope that helps her. It, it's probably easier if you just take a workshop with me. Um, uh, Cause it's um, like, it's, 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 you sort of have to do it, but uh, yeah. And another uh, process question from Rachel. Um, which is, do you write in either each uh, scene or each episode, however you want to look at it, do you write a lot more and then cut way back? Or, or do you, you know, go along with a lot of, of what you've written originally? And do you write many drafts? Yeah, um, yeah, I, 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 you know, overwrite a lot. I mean, that's, I mean, that's sort of part of the, the beauty of it. You just write a, write a ton and then go back in and read it over. And I, I, I see it very positively. I, I try to really because uh, it could be very negative because the majority of what I write is terrible. Um, so, but I just look for like the good stuff and then I sort of pull that out and just and forget about the stuff that seems like it's dead, that's not alive. So it's, I, I, see, I see it as a very positive uh, celebratory thing, even though, you know, I've spent like many hours writing things that will never, no one will ever read, but there's the few things that, that do come out of it seem worthwhile. Um, yeah, I wanted sort of, to ask you, you, Nick, about like just ordering the parts you know, and if you do think, um, uh, you know, with a narrative book, do, do you think about pacing? You, do you think like, and, and wanting separating comic ones from sort of more, I mean, you know, how, how that process, yeah. um, you know, be, as a story writer, I mean, that was a big part of putting a book of short stories together. You know, I actually did think about, I want people to read it straight through yeah. and what that, and thinking about that experience. So what, yeah. what you do, yeah. Yeah, I think about the structure a lot. That usually comes at the end and I, I structure it and, and it is like, you know, I hope, I mean, I, you know, it, the book is, I'm, I'm, I'm a, you know, Mass I'm from Massachusetts and our sense of humor is, is different than probably the sense of humor in the Midwest. Uh, you know, like I know with other books I've read, like Another Bullshit Night in Sex City, people in like, you know, in Minnesota, they weep when they hear it. They think it's a tragedy. And in Boston, people just laugh. They think it's like hysterically funny. Um, and so I, like, even when I was reading now, like I, there are passages in here that I thought, you know, I, don't, I mean, I thought they were funny. Unfortunately, without an audience, I, I can't see, usually there'd be one person laughing, you know, who's from Boston, you know, who's like, you know, thinks that's funny, but it's but sort of a dark humor. Think, yeah. 
by the way, with, with, with humor, like you just want, like I've read things that are funny and people don't know that they're allowed to laugh, you know, certain times, yeah. like it's, it's just weird. Like once someone does laugh, then suddenly everybody's laughing, but it's, yeah, yeah I don't know. In the Midwest, I just tell them that they can laugh and then they laugh. Good. Yeah. 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 I'm laughing from Quincy. <laughs> I just saw a note pop up, a chat pop up. Yeah. Well, gentlemen, with our thanks, I think we are at about our time here. So I've uh, just for everyone in the chat, uh, thank you so much for coming. I've posted one more time the link to buy the book from the store if you're interested. Again, all the books come with signed book plates, and we have got a limited number of broadsides, um, broadside posters uh, that will go as supplies last. Those are available from us as well. But Nick, Tom, thank you so much. Nick, congratulations on the new book. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thanks it's, for it's hosting really, us. Yeah, yeah, it's been great. Thanks a lot. Yeah, yeah. All right, everybody. Bye. Thanks for coming. Thank you.